verse 8. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. This word Jerusalem isn't the Jerusalem that we know of it today. We see in Joshua 18 that the city belongs to Benjamin. And this was most likely a border city between Judah and Benjamin. And so the city of Jerusalem was burned here. But it wasn't, the people weren't driven out. So the Jebusites still lived here. The Jebusites that were living here didn't get taken over and driven out until David came in in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and he drives the Jebusites out of the city of Jerusalem and David takes over the city of Jerusalem and makes it his capital. So that's the Jerusalem that we're talking about here. And we're going to see that Jerusalem again in a couple verses later. But it says it struck with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Notice that they're, again, they're taking care of the land, but they're only striking it with the edge of the sword. And to me, this means blood is not covering the whole sword, which would indicate that they are destroying the entire city. Blood is only on the edge of the sword, which means they are only driving out part of the city. And God's command was not to drive out part of the city. It was to drive out the inhabitants of the city completely with the full sword, not just the edge of the sword. For there's two parts to this command, take care of the land and then take care of the people. They're taking care of the land here. And afterwards, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, in the Negeb, and in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, and they defeated Sheshai and Ahimon and Talmai. Here comes another character in the story, and that is Caleb. And Caleb has a story. Caleb has a legacy that he is passing down. And we're going to see how Caleb's faithfulness really is the example that we need to be following. Verse 11, from there they went against the inhabitants of Deber. The name of Deber was formerly kiriath Sefer, And Caleb said, he who attacks kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. Remember, Caleb was one of the 12 spies back in Moses' day, back in the book of Numbers, when 12 spies were sent out to get intel on the land of Canaan. Caleb and Joshua were the two out of the 12 who represented the 12 tribes, they are the only two that came back with a report to Moses and said, we can do this because God said he's on our side. So we can do it. The other 10 of the other 10 tribes, they said, we can't do it. The people are bigger. They're stronger. They have better armies. They have better weaponry. They have better battle tactics. There's no way we can fight against the Canaanites. But Caleb and Joshua said, yes, we can do this. This is that Caleb. This is that Caleb who also Moses promised to give him an inheritance. We read in the book of Numbers that Moses tells Caleb, you are going to inherit a great land because you have been faithful. You have been a faithful servant. That is this Caleb. Now Caleb is saying, whoever captures this land for me, I will give them my daughter. I'm not sure if Aksa would have felt used in a negative way. It's likely that Aksa would have felt honored to be used as a person who could bring inheritance to the land, who could, who could save part of her land. And verse 13 says, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. Othniel comes in and he takes the land, he takes the girl, and he takes the inheritance. This is good for Othniel. Othniel's a good guy. Othniel becomes Israel's first judge in chapter 3 that we're going to read in later studies. Othniel, notice it says, is Caleb's younger brother. In some commentaries, it says Othniel is Caleb's younger nephew. In any case, Othniel is a relative of Caleb. He has heard Caleb's story. He has heard Caleb's faithfulness. Probably from Caleb's own lips, he has probably told Othniel the story of when he was sent out with Joshua to spy out the land of Canaan and what he saw there. Othniel is hearing things from Caleb. He knows how Caleb has been a faithful servant, how Moses regarded him as a faithful servant. Verse 16. And the descendants of the Kenite, Moses, his father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad. And they went and settled with the people. These are the people of Jethro. This is Moses' father-in-law. 
and they chose to settle with the people of Judah because Judah is the strongest, safest choice. They are choosing Judah. Verse 17, And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephoth and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was called Hormah. This is when Judah is now paying back his, his promise. Remember in the beginning of the chapter, Judah says, Hey, Simeon, come with me. We're going to have victory. And if you come with me, I'll go with you later. And this is, this is the time now that Judah is now going with Simeon because he said he would. He's holding his end of the deal. I love that. And so Judah goes with Simeon and do they have success? Yes, they do. In verse 17, it says that they defeated the Canaanites and they devoted it to destruction. This is great. They're destroying the land just as God had commanded. But what are they doing with the people? Verse 18, Judah also captured Gaza. Great and its territory, and Eshkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. They're taking care of the land. They are capturing the land. They are destroying the land. They are claiming the land. This is what God has commanded. But God also commanded that they would drive out the inhabitants of the land. Verse 19, and the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country. Notice the Lord is continuing to be with Judah. He's continuing to give success because Judah is obeying the first half of this command. But now let's look to see what Judah doesn't do. In the rest of verse 19, it says, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. This is the part that Judah does not obey. He does not drive out the inhabitants of the land or the plain because they had chariots of iron. Chariots of iron represented something really big. Iron universally symbolizes strength and power and courage and confidence. If you're looking onto a group of people with chariots of iron and you've just got foot soldiers, you can probably assume that those chariots of iron are going to destroy your foot soldiers because there's no way you can come against chariots of iron. Iron was the strongest metal. So when Judah looked over and he saw the chariots of iron, he would have been correct to assume this is a strong force. I don't know if we can do this, but God had already told them that they had the victory. All they had to do was go into the land, destroy the land and drive out the inhabitants of the land. Yet Judah looks over and he sees chariots of iron and he says, we have no chance. This is the part of the story that takes the turn. And this is the part of the story that we also can relate to because we're looking out on our problems and we keep saying, I can't do this. And God is saying, you're right. You can't, but with me, you can. I want us to look at a verse. Psalm 68, 17 says this, the chariots of God are twice 10,000. Remember that number 10,000 just means a number too big to count. The chariots of God are twice 10,000 thousands upon thousands, the Lord is among them. So when Judah was looking out over the chariots of iron and he says, there's no way we can defeat them. And God says, you're right. You can't on your own, but I have 10 thousands upon 10 thousands of chariots for you to use at your disposal. Are you going to do it? And for us today, when we're facing our challenge, we look out and we say, I can't do this. And God says, you're right, you can't, but I have 10,000 chariots at your disposal for you to use. Are we using God's chariots or why are we looking out on our problems and seeing all of these chariots of iron and saying to ourselves, I can't do it. Because at that point, That's the open door that the enemy needs to come in and say, you're right, you can't, you're weak. There's no way you're gonna have victory in this. Just wallow in it, feel sorry for yourself. Think about how weak you are. As soon as we let the enemy come in and start whispering those lies to us, we do not drive out the inhabitants of the plain. The land that God is talking about here in Judges is our hearts. It's our homes. It's where we work. Anywhere we are advancing the gospel is our land. And God is saying, I'm giving you victory in your land. You just have to go in and drive out all the sin. And Satan comes in and says, no, no, you can't do it. You're too weak. 
on your own. You can't do it. We need to remember what Psalm 68, 17 says, that God has ten thousands upon thousands of chariots, and he's among them all. Verse 20, and Hebron was given to Caleb. This is just as Moses had promised. In Numbers 14, 24, Moses promises Caleb's inheritance. If you want to take a look at that, it's in Numbers chapter 14. So Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak. Those are the three people mentioned in verse 10. Shashai, Ahiman, and Tamai, they're also mentioned in the book of Numbers. So he drives them out. This is great. I want you to notice that Caleb is the only one who is being faithful to God's command. Caleb is the only one who is taking the land and he's driving the people out. And verse 20 is so huge because that's, that's all we see of Caleb and him driving out the people. So now we are on verse 21, but the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. Remember, those are the Jebusites who were, have not been driven out. They don't get driven out until 2 Samuel 5 when David comes in and makes it his capital. So they're still living there. Benjamin didn't drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites had lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. This is the contrast between what Caleb did and what everyone else is doing. Caleb takes the land, drives out the people who are in that land. And this is why Caleb is remembered as someone who was a faithful servant.